Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Good. Good to see you all again. I know uh, some of you from the early days of the Rumsfeld Foundation and such far places as uh, Batumi, Georgia, where we had our first Kamka, although we didn't, we didn't really call it Kamka then, did we? It wasn't quite Kamka yet. No. This is an amazing achievement um, that uh, is a tribute to the hard work that Sarah uh, has put in and David Sumbadze, Fred Starr, and so many people who have been with this program for what, 15 years now. Um, it's, an it's an amazing, amazing thing to see you all and so many familiar voices. Um, so this is obviously the first CAMCA that we've had post-COVID. It is also the first reunion we've had without the man who started it all, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, who all of us in this room share a connection with, um, an affinity for, a deep admiration, um, and uh, you know, my entire career is really um, because of him. And uh, so I was delighted when Sarah asked me to, uh, to help moderate this event, which was to remember his life and to uh, remember why uh, he put together uh, this part, why he put together the foundation and specifically this part, which uh, you know, among the many causes that was dear to his heart, I think this was something that was really special to him and something that when we um, created the foundation in 2007, um, we both thought would be probably the most enduring legacy of the Rumsfeld Foundation. And so to see its growth and uh, all of your achievements and um, your careers and, and your, your home countries is just uh, a really, uh, it's a tribute to that vision, um, which I think will uh, endure for many generations to come. So um, I think we want to have a pretty broad-ranging conversation today with, uh, with our panelists today. You all know uh, my dear friend Sarah Tanucci, uh, who has been helming the foundation for many, many years now, uh, and has done a wonderful job expanding it um, and extending its, its longevity well into uh, the 21st century. Um, joined also uh, by, Tush, by Tushin Gantulga of Mongolia and uh, Tamuna Kankadze uh, of Georgia. And I think it's appropriate that that spans the full west to east of, uh, of the region, which is, you know, I think one of the things I, I do want to talk about today is sort of why Secretary Rumsfeld conceived of Central Asia and the Caucasus so broadly to include these poles. Um, and there are many discussions and debates about what constituted the region of interest, why, what similarities these countries had um, together, uh, and what their legacy and, and future could be. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about that today. So with that, I, I, that's really all I want to say in the beginning. I, I'll, I'll come back and, and make some remarks um, just about Secretary Rumsfeld and why I think, in my view, he felt so strongly um, about this region to um, invest as heavily uh, philanthropically as, as he did uh, beginning in 2007 with um, the launch of the Rumsfeld Foundation. But I want to turn it over to, to Sarah just to talk a little bit about your experience. And, and uh, I don't think there's anyone over the last decade who worked as closely day in and day out as you did with Secretary Rumsfeld and, and you know, really fulfilling his, uh, his vision of what uh, CAMCA could be. Sure. Thank you, Keith. Um, First, Tori said this earlier this morning in her welcoming remarks, but I just know that he would be so, so happy to see all of your faces and the fact that so many of you came from all across Kamka to be here despite complications with COVID and visas and life. Um, it would mean so much to him that you all came here. So thank you for, for making the trip. Um, he delighted so much in spending time with the fellows, and I think you all could tell that when you spent time with him. And you know, someone in our office would come in and try and say, like, you got your next appointment, or something like that, and he would kind of wave them off because he really preferred to spend time with the fellows instead. Um, one thing, as I was reflecting on things and going back to his kind of purpose behind this or what it grew to be over time, in the beginning, it really was more of a thought of 
it would be valuable to give the opportunity for some people from your part of the world to come to the United States and learn more about it, and that that would be a beneficial thing. Um, over time, after you started meeting with more and more people in Washington, D.C., he would then kind of have conversations afterwards with someone you had sat down with, and they would say, that was so interesting, you know, that young guy from Mongolia, there's so much going on there, or it really opened their eyes to the region. So he started thinking, oh, there's another element to this that I hadn't really thought of. We're also educating Americans about the region and getting them more interested and engaged. And maybe next time that they see something in the news about Kazakhstan, maybe they're gonna pay a little more attention, or maybe they're gonna think about expanding their business there. Um, but the third dimension, which took a few groups to kind of come to light, and after we did our first reunions um, in Batumi and Issaquul, was the fact that the fellows were all coming together with one another. And that's what really excited him, was this network element, and that you all, as rising leaders across all sectors who are dedicated to the futures of your countries, you were getting to know one another and you were starting businesses together, and you were inviting one another to teach at your universities, and you were having holidays and visiting each other's families, and the idea that you all were getting connected is what he really saw as the true potential of the network. And I think over time, while he thought those other elements of that US camp linkage was beneficial and is beneficial, really what he felt most strongly about was the network element. And a quick thing that all the fellows will remember is he would take each group of fellows out to lunch. We often split the groups into two because he wanted to make sure he really got a chance to talk to each one and get to know each person. Mm -hmm. So it would be about five or six people per lunch. And at every lunch, he would go around the table and ask them to say how many of the other 10 countries they had visited. And often, there was the rare people that maybe because they were a diplomat or something, they'd been to quite a few. But often it was zero, one, maybe two. Um, and he just thought that was so telling as to how disconnected the region was and how the potential of the program and the network bringing people together could hopefully change that over time. And so I think, I'll, I'll stop there, but I think that element of this being such a disconnected region and the opportunity to bring these bright rising leaders together is really what motivated him to be so focused on this area. No, that's a great segue to what I wanted to, to ask Tushin uh, in particular, um, <clears throat> you know, which is, you know, Given the disparate ethnicities, languages, geography, and the thousands of miles that this area encompasses, um, I, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit toward, you know, to, you know, as a Mongolian, why, you know, what you make of sort of the commonality of this group and why um, you thought, you know, Mr. Rumsfeld made Mongolia a part of it and, and, um, you know, what that means going forward for the region. Yeah, um, well, we've had quite a few Kamka forums throughout Central Asia and Caucasus and Mongolia by now, and uh, in almost all of the uh, Kamka forums, uh, you know, we have the country briefing, and in, you know, usually it's me who's giving the Mongolia briefing, mm -hmm. and sometimes I uh, start my uh, briefing by saying, if any of my ancestors did anything terrible in your region, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's also a testament to the fact that, um, you know, we sh do share a common history, we do share a common, you know, uh, values and cultural elements. And it was just a matter of, you know, bringing them together into a coherent structure. And of course, uh, it was really Secretary Rumsfeld who, you know, with Kamka really did that. Um, so there's also, you know, uh, to me, Secretary Rumsfeld is an important figure who contributed immensely to the Mongolia-US relations. And uh, as uh, I've been told that uh, 
uh, Kamka at some point of its inception was almost called Kaka because you know <laughs> Mongolia was not included in it. But um, uh, you know, Dr. Rumsfeld insisted that you know Mongolia, that bridging important M in the middle, uh, should be there. And you know, it's just a testament to his strategic vision, vision and uh, prescience that you know um, how much America, U.S. means to the to us, you know, these countries who are often feel that we need more, um, you know, attention from the U.S. side, and also you know how much uh, we can deliver, uh, we can also mean uh, to, to to the United States. Um, Case in point, you know, Mongolia, of course, is an oasis of democracy stranded between Russia and China. And, uh, you know, for us, U.S. attention and encouragement means a lot in terms of, uh, you know, proving to us that our way of democratic living is, you know, the right way to go, you know, and we're not alone. And Secretary Rumsfeld uh, certainly played a imp very important role in terms of, you know, giving that to us Mongolians. And he uh, visited Mongolia three times, you know, as a Secretary of Defense, and you know, no other Secretary of Defense had done that before. Uh, and on the other hand, you know, Mongolia had contributed uh, 1,200 troops to Iraq, you know, uh, uh, 6,000 troops in Afghanistan, and almost 10,000 troops in South Sudan, you know. And it's just a testament that how strategically he thought about you know, our engagement with our countries and how much it paid off uh, to both to the US and Mongolia. Um, but that's really sort of the macro stuff, right? <laughs> uh, but again, you know, uh, to me, the Secretary Rumsfeld's legacy is very important you know, also for my everyday life. Uh, as uh, some of you may know, you know I, also, I, wore, I wear many hats and one of them was public uh, servant. Uh, and there's not a single day went by uh, without me thinking about uh, Rumsfeld rules. Uh, and, you know, it was, it's, it's a fantastic resource uh, which is very underrated. And I, for example, just yesterday I was talking with Sarah about, you know, we, everyone was wearing the na name tags, right? And I remember in 2015 when I was a fellow, Dr. Rumsfeld came in, Tushing, you're wearing your name tag wrong. You know, you should be wearing on your right <laughs> side because you know, when you shake hands, whoever you're serving for should be able to see your name. And ever since then, you know, it's kind of small everyday things that, but I, I carry it with me. And also, you know, like always wear black socks, you know, because <laughs> uh, you don't have to think a lot about, you know, uh, uh, small decisions or like always work out of your outbox, uh, you know, in, uh, sorry, outbox. Otherwise you will be, you know, uh, working uh, somebody's inbox, right? So those kind of really important lessons um, and I carry it with him every day. So it's really the sort of macro level and micro level he touched our lives and imparted his wisdom. Great. Uh, Tamuna, I understand, you know, you, you, one of the, Rumsfeld always bristled at the word legacy. You know, he would be asked in, in you know, by journalists every week, what do you want your legacy to be? And he said, uh, you know, his go-to answer is, I don't do legacies. Other people will define it. I, it doesn't matter to me. Um, you know, when I'm when I'm passed away, other people will make their own judgments about, you know, my role in history. I don't think about it. I just felt like I got up every day to do the best best that I could do. Keep in mind the values that were important to me, and and that's how I, I think about my life as a whole. But, you know, Tamuna, when it comes to Georgia and sort of the relationship that, you know, partly through Mr. Rumsfeld, but partly because of, um, you know, 2012 and more recent events with Russia, the Ministry of Defense relationship has been strong. And, and I understand, you know, there's a lot that, that uh, there, there's, there's a, a leadership academy and, and things that, uh, you know, have been put in place in honor of Secretary Rumsfeld. And so when we think about legacy, um, it's gratifying to know that, that Georgia um, thinks about him and sort of his importance today. So I'm, I'm hoping you can talk to us a little bit um, about that. Thank you, Keith. Today is a very emotional day for all of us in this room. Um, I wanted to share that in the Georgian group, uh, when we talked about Secretary Ramsold, we always refer to him as a grandpa Ramsold. Mm -hmm. So that's the sentiment that each of 
uh, access to, towards him. And you rightly mentioned that Secretary Ramsworth was a great friend of Georgia. He was a long-standing friend, and um, some might not know, but under his leadership in 2002, special equipment training program started, and that program became the fundamental to help Georgian security and defense to rise on the top and to become NATO interoperable and to make sure that, that we have maybe small but still our own capacity to defend the, the, our country. And in addition to that, we saw that when he left his uh, service at the government, he was involved in all the other our countries, as Sushin rightly mentioned. And after being part of this fellowship, and I think that this fellowship touched the life of each and every fellow, no matter which country we come from, in many dimensions. And just to refer to one example, even for myself, this was the first time where I met uh, people from Central Asia, Mongolia, and Afghanistan. So basically, this program serves its purpose. So after, unfortunately, Secretary Ramsol died, we were Georgians thinking what we can do because we saw that he was leading by his own example and we thought that we own him, we own the team which invested in us to do what we could do. So to, uh, to honor his legacy, we decided, uh, and especially his links to security and defense, uh, we decided to establish special stipend, Ramsol stipend for the cadets of Georgian Defense Academy. Mm -hmm. So every year now, uh, more than 12 uh, outstanding cadets will receive that stipend that is already starting from January. At the same time, and you see the pictures now, um, um, this month the, we open special uh, Ramsold Auditorium, which will serve as a focal point at the uh, National Defense Academy for the special series and discussions on different important issues, starting from security and defense and broader democracy and other strategic topics. And we were very happy that the leadership from the Ministry of Defense and also U.S. Embassy was there uh, to join our effort. And I remember that one of the phrases that struck me uh, uh, when the uh, deputy DCM of the, from the U.S. Embassy was saying that uh, while she talked about Rumsfeld and the way he brought Georgia and U.S. together, she said that this event will become also a milestone in the history of the cooperation between Georgia and the US. And for us, it's very gratifying that we, as Ramsfeld Fellows, could do maybe very symbolic but very important part uh, to honor his legacy. So we are very happy about that. Well, it's, it's, it's such a wonderful tribute that that place exists and that cadets uh, and Georgian military leaders will see that as they go through the ranks and get imbued with some of the leadership lessons and some of the strategic vision that I think and feel very strongly um, was unique for Rumsfeld. And you know, I want to take the discussion back a little bit to um, both the 2002-2008 era and why I think it's easy to look with hindsight back you know, or, 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 or think about where America is in 2022, where the world is, um, and sort of the, the idea that, you know, post-invasion of Ukraine and, and sort of now assumptions that are baked into our entire discussion here in the United States and around the world about the rise of China, um, the resurgence of Russia as a great power, um, you know, the, the sort of the mantra we hear over and over again, at least in this town, um, of, you know, of great power competition, that this was something that in 2000, you know, one, when Secretary Rumsfeld came back to the Pentagon for the second time, these were all things he was, he was thinking about. And, you know, we were very much um, in an era um, of, you know, holiday from history and, and, you know, the end of the Cold War and the unipolar moment. And, you know, I think there was certainly a sense of complacency. And then obviously 9-11 happened. And I think a lot of people, you know, wrongly assume that this forum exists because of, you know, the wars in Afghanistan and, and you know, the Middle East and sort of the strategic importance of the region in that sense. And I don't think that's true. I think 
Rumsfeld had a view of this region that predated 9-11 that understood that, um, you know, that dated back to his time as first Secretary of Defense and sort of the Cold War and his experience, you know, frankly, as just sort of a citizen in Chicago where, you know, he had come to know through, through representing them in Congress uh, and then going back in the private sector in the 90s, so many Poles and Czechs and Eastern Europeans who, you know, had sort of gone, lived under the Iron Curtain, lived under, you know, Soviet dominance, and then, you know, post-1991, all of a sudden we're sort of dealing with the challenges of freedom and, and free speech and elections and, and transitioning from command economies to free market economies. And I think he felt that was absent in this, in this region. And, and he knew that, you know, as early as 2000, 2001. And then, um, you know, as he, he sort of, went and spent a lot of the time in the region as Secretary of Defense, getting to know many of your leaders at the time. Um, I, I think that, that only confirmed his original vision. But there was no one else in Washington who, you know, understood, except for maybe a few people in the State Department whose specialty was this region, um, that this was, you know, in a lot of ways, sort of the pivot of the 21st century, that your region was going to be that, and I, um, you know, it was remarkable as a young man to work for him. Uh, I started working for him in 2005, and then in 2007 I went to work and, and helped um, start up this foundation. And you know, it was sort of a like drinking from a fire hose, understanding all the complexities and, and just sort of all the rich history that this region had. And you know, I, I, I guess I want to sort of kick it back to our, our panel here, and maybe we can go back and back in order. But you know. What, when you think of strategic vision and prescience and sort of what Rumsfeld, you know, what was gravitated toward the region itself, what, what, do, you, what do you ascribe it to? Um, I mean, honestly, I do think it, it predated all of that, but I go back to, I think when he was like really sold on it, and was like, there's really something here, was after a couple years of engaging with the fellows. And I really think that they like turned the tide from it being, this is an interesting, like nice concept. I've been fortunate in my life. I'd like to give back. This is a nice thing to do to, there's really something here. And he just had this like inkling gut instinct that it was really important to continue investing yep. in. And I think one thing I want to get across that I don't think everyone necessarily would see from the outside is just how much of a passion project it was for him, which Keith saw and was on the inner side of. But I mean, he's sending me the snowflakes um, every day with like, what about this idea? What about this idea? They should meet with this person. We should do this. He would, you know, just everywhere he went, all the time he was thinking about it, trying to figure out ways that it could be more productive and beneficial. And I spent hours on end talking with him about these ideas and he just was so engaged and interested because of getting to know the fellows and truly deeply believing that there was something <coughs> special that was happening that could have major impact, you know, 20, 30, however many years from now. And I think I think that's exactly right. And and you know he was um, among many things he was an entrepreneur. So he tried things. He experimented. And I, I agree with you. You know when when he conceived of this in 2007, um, he wasn't sure which parts of the foundation were going to be enduring. We were doing microfinance for years, um, and you know he he was just sort of a tinkerer and and liked to try Very new things <laughs> and. Um, you know, I think that dates back to his years in business, but the fact that he was willing to try this and do something that no one else was doing at the time, see what happened, and yeah. invest more if it worked, and that's exactly what, what, what happened. Um, Tushin, what would you like to say? Sure. Um, well, in 2015, we had the Kamka Forum in Lombatter, and back then, I remember some people who are not necessarily familiar with Kamka, they heard about Kamka, and they somehow felt that Kamka is more or less forced, you know, thing. Uh, it's not necessarily a, you know, coherent thing, but 
now, you know, it makes more sense. I mean, perfect sense, uh, you know, given what's happening around the world, you know, our countries uh, coming together and as a region, um, it's amazing how far ahead uh, Dr. Rumsfeld saw uh, the entire region. And, you know, frankly, we even didn't, ourselves didn't even realize it until we visited, you know, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Caucasus, you know, uh, you know, we, we realize we share so much common and, you know, our interests are in most of the ways aligned and, you know, uh, and it just made perfect sense. So, you know, it just, to me, I, I really don't know how he figured it all out, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, even people living in the region had no idea. But I'm pretty sure, you know, in seeing that far ahead uh, in Washington, D.C., and actually, you know, making it happen, coming to fruition you know, all this, bringing us all together, uh, it's just a testament to, uh, you know, what kind of uh, thinker he was and how he saw the entire thing. Yeah. And to close, well, Tabuna, why don't, yeah, why don't you uh, offer your I remember your having exactly this discussion mm -hmm. with him when mm -hmm. we had the lunch while uh, being here as a fellows. Mm -hmm. And I remember myself being quite direct and maybe a bit rude and harsh mm -hmm. while mm -hmm. uh, telling him that this is really artificial region and there is nothing like this, that the Georgia and I was talking from the perspective of the Georgia that we don't see, we see ourselves as a part of the Black Sea Europe. And I mean, this does not make sense in terms of defining as a, it as a region. And I remember him, him telling me that these things are not exclusive, mutually exclusive. No, these things complement each other. And he was trying to tell me that you should know your neighbors and you should know your cycle and region as much as you can and that's important. And I remember having these conversations over and over uh, throughout the forums and I think when I look back, I think this is, the, this is a concept that I would use this word hooked me up uh, and created my sentiments towards the Kamka and this is why since 2014 I cannot let it go because a lot of people around me are telling me, come on, I mean, you were working with the European platforms, I mean, why are you so invested? Because I think subconsciously then during this very heated debate I believe that there was some truth in it and more time passes and more experience these countries, regions, the communication with Georgia and the way it affects our life altogether. I think this is true, and, but I also realize that we're still uh, in the middle way and we're still figuring out. And I myself, I cannot clearly give you the right answer or even my answer why I am so much invested in this. But I think these are the thoughts that really like Maybe he was struggling with that in a positive way, and he wanted to show others that this is important. And I'm really happy to be part of this big family. Well, well um, thank you, Sarah, for arranging the panel. And um, you know, as much as Mr. Rumsfeld loathed the word legacy, I know that he would be extraordinarily proud to see you all here again with each other and um, doing so much for the future of your region, the future of US relations with the region, and for each other. So uh, hopefully I can visit with some of you after this. And, and uh, thanks for a great panel. Appreciate Thank it, all you. of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.